Hello, my name is Sarah Jane Parsons, and I'm the gallery director of the art galleries at TCU. And I'd like to tell you about our new exhibition that's at the Fort Worth Contemporary Arts Gallery. Raw Weir, We Do Not Choose Our Dictators, is an exhibition featuring photography and multimedia, and it features the work of six photographers from the Middle East who together work as a collective called Raw Weir. And I'm joined today by Tasneem Al Sultan and Tanya Habjoka. Habjoka, pardon me. And we're going to be talking a little bit with each of them about their practice in photography and about Rawia, how it works together as a collective. Uh, but before we do that, I should invite you all to see the exhibition. It's going to be running until May 13th. And you can find Fort Worth Contemporary Arts Gallery on the corner of Westbury, 2900 Westbury and Green. Uh, we're opposite we like to say we're opposite uh, Cafe Brazil and we're right next to the TCU costume shop. So you can find us right there on the corner of 2900 Westbury. Um, so today we're going to be learning a little bit about photographic practices and slow journalism, which is a phrase which is kind of new to me uh, and from my research has brought me to these two incredible women uh, who've flown in from Saudi Arabia and East Jerusalem. We're very excited that they could come all the way to Fort Worth and spend this time with us. Really, I want to turn this over to you guys and uh, each of you, if you could just uh, perhaps introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you how you got started in uh, photography. Um, let's see, who would like to run the gauntlet? <laughs> So, yeah, hi, thank you for having me. It's a great honor and a privilege to fly across the world and share my work and Zrawiya's work um, with everyone here. So, yeah, I'm Saudi. My parents um, are academics, so I was born abroad in the U.S. And, and this is Tasneem speaking. So. Yes. <laughs> and when I was six, I grew up uh, from six to 16 in England, Manchester. So I think I had... Um, a very great, you know, childhood in learning about myself as a third culture kid and always trying to negotiate what who I am and what I can bring to the table and offer. So I'm very defensive and overprotective probably over the culture that I'm representing that is different than mine. So when I'm in Saudi, I'm talking about, you know, Westerners. And when I'm in the West, I talk about Arabs. Um, I was a wedding photographer after I studied uh, my... Um, BA was in social linguistics and English literature, and my master's was in social linguistics with a minor in anthropology, and my thesis was about Saudi women studying abroad and their identity issues. Photography was a hobby, mm -hmm. so I photographed many, many weddings. And then I applied to Magnum Foundation slash um, Arab Fund for Cultural and Arts slash Prince Klaus, and this is one grant, it's one program, where... Luckily for me, um, Tanya Habjuka was my mentor. Ah, <laughs> and, the um, connection. <laughs> yeah. And my project initially was the irony of a Saudi wedding photographer that is divorced and how I want to be a, star a storyteller and actually explore the reality ever after of marriage, love, widows, and loss. And um, through that narrative, through that project of six months mentorship, I really delved into photography as a journalism and, and kind of really felt like, okay, this is this is the work that I want to um, proceed for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. And we should probably say at this at this moment, you mentioned storytelling. And yeah. would you tell everybody what Rawia means? So it means she who tells a story. And I think I don't want to say that I'm an artist or um, a journalist. I think a storyteller has something much more authentic to it. it. It doesn't show your job as a career. It shows more of I want to give a a grasp of the people that I'm photographing. So it's not about me. It's more about mm -hmm. you. Um, and I think, you know, I wanted initially to pursue my education. Um, but people who would read about your thesis would be very, you know, from a, a very selective status from a region specific and not as photography where now you're using platforms like Instagram to kind of educate everyone and share stories and narratives for a worldwide audience. Mm -hmm. So Rawia does that. It's, it's a platform to kind of give stories to a region that's not always represented in a way that's very authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of parachute photographers. We have a lot of people who are even sometimes local photographers don't tell the stories that need to be told because they're not as juicy and great to photograph. Uh, so they're not as authentic. They're not really truthful depictions yeah. of life in the Middle East. So I don't life. think it's because of gender or race. It's just our um, initiative is not always what it should be. So. Mm -hmm. 
I and mean, Tanya. I, just, just to add on that, I mean, just to be careful, I actually think that there are some amazing uh, Middle Eastern journalists Agreed. and photojournalists and photographers. And I just think that in, in terms of wire... Uh, organizations, there's very important work that's being done. So I wouldn't denigrate that. It's more about the uh, opportunities in documentary mm -hmm. and fine art, which yeah. is expanding. It's an emerging market and there's voices that are coming out. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And Tanya, um, okay, tell us about, because you're one of the original founding members of Rowia, which started back in 2009. And it sounds like a very dynamic organization as a collective that you're really working together over large geographical distances um, and with different organizations and then providing each other um, support. But also your members have changed over time. Some people have fallen away and, and you have new members now. Could you, as introducing yourself, talk a little bit about from the beginning days of Rawia to what it, what it looks like and feels like now? Absolutely. So my name is Tanya Habjoka. I am half Jordanian, half Texan. I was born in Jordan. My mother is proper, proper Texan. My <laughs> grandfather, my American grandfather was a deputy sheriff in Fort Worth, Texas. And we should tell people you are wearing cowboy boots today. Of Cow course. Cowgirl boots, sorry. Both, both, both of us are. Both and of I, them are. And my daughter. Gentlemen and her daughter. <laughs> my five-year-old here, we went to the Justin uh, outlets <laughs> and gave homage to uh, <laughs> But um, so I, I grew up, I went to Arlington Heights High School, I went to UNT for my undergrad, I have a deep, I, I began photography working at the Fort Worth Weekly and had one of the most ethical lessons that I could in terms of representation taught by Betty Brink, who was mm. a fabulous investigative reporter here. Um, so I went to the Middle East and worked uh, as a freelancer in, in news, did some little wire bits here and there covered uh, some conflict, Iraq, I covered the war in Lebanon in 2006, and I, I just found it at times stifling finding a platform to be able to explore the dialogue. Um, that it, it, it just, we didn't really have a space necessarily as so-called local photographers, which sometimes can be a denigrating term. Mm. Um, if you weren't with a platform that existed, such as AP, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were an individual photographer trying to come up with new documentary work, it didn't really, individually, you could maybe get a show here and there. But we decided to come together, to band together with the sort of idea of strength in numbers. And Rawia began with a conversation, uh, Nusha Tavakian, mm -hmm. who is no longer with uh, Rawia, but very much a beloved uh, member. We think of her often. She's with Magnum now. Um, Nusha was in Beirut. And keeping in mind the geopolitical realities, mm -hmm. we it's very difficult for all of us to be in the same place. At the same time. At yeah. the same time, or even access some countries some of us will not be able to go to. Mm -hmm. Where I'm based, Nusha would never be allowed mm -hmm. to go, for one example. And also things that maybe in the West that are taken for granted, like simple internet access, sometimes is compromised. I know from having worked with artists in Yemen, it's not always easy for them to communicate as seamlessly and as quickly as we might imagine so I think it's not just internet it's more censorship mm -hmm. and I think it's also education um, maybe in the Levant and in Iran especially they've had a, an amazing archive of artists and photographers or just any kind of art but in, in my region I guess in the Arab Gulf countries Saudi, Kuwait, Emirates, uh, Bahrain we have never had an actual um, study or education in arts in our own schools for instance and or if it does out of Saudi probably but it's never been very strong in a way that we can actually have the freedom of expression so with with Rawia I think the the people who founded it are actually kind of supporting that supporting the freedom of of using arts as an expression it, it is a way I think of activism of some sort I think that the I Iran uh, in some ways, in terms of conceptual and new documentary work, were a bit ahead of us. And they mm -hmm. very creatively found ways of critiquing, yeah. uh, let's say, government-imposed realities mm -hmm. through their work by taking conceptual approaches. And they were they, some of my favorite photographers in the, in the region actually come from Iran. And I think that right now... It's kind. It's an exploding scene in photography. But when I was growing up, why are you doing this? Why are you taking pictures of these people? What is this? This is silly. Stop. It wasn't something that you would consider a respectful mm -hmm. profession. And now, and I think the advent of uh, you know the rise of social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook. What's happening is quite phenomenal because the, a young photographers are connecting and putting putting themselves out there. But on another level. 
there's been a challenge to the traditional top-down expression of representation. And so now there's a dialogue, a, a mm-hmm. critique when uh, people come, whether from within the community or, as Tasneem mentioned, parachute journalists, people will come, document, and if they feel that they've been misrepresented, there's now a platform mm-hmm. of access mm-hmm. to, to, respond, to counter that. To respond yeah. to that, yeah. And right now you've got this unbelievable program, which, God, I wish we'd had growing oh, up. Yeah. <laughs> Magnum Foundation, who I think is probably, for those based here, it's an organization I re- highly suggest that you research. Magnum Foundation, Prince Klaus Foundation in uh, Amsterdam, and AFOC. AFOC. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunate acronym sometimes but it's the (laughs) Arab Fund for Arts and Culture and they've banded together to make this unbelievable we just finished our third pilot and we it was so successful we're continuing and so they give grants to the top uh, emerging photographers from North Africa the Levant from the the Arab speaking countries Arab speaking countries Mm -hmm. and Tasneem was was one of those recipients but they give uh, they fly everyone together to Beirut we we pair up with and there's phenomenal mentors and we pair up, we mentor online for six months, and they fly us back together, and, and we edit and sequence, and then Susan Mycellus also comes in at the end. Mm. And, 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 it, and then the work is taken and promoted in magazines mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. galleries, and we're creating this, this hyper network that mm-hmm. didn't exist before, partially because of the geopolitical realities, mm-hmm. and we're all coming together. And it's, it's really an exciting time for photography and new documentary practices in the mm-hmm. Middle East. And, and in terms of um, your own your own work and some of your own projects and, and work that people will see when they visit Fort Worth Contemporary Arts, um, would you talk a little bit about that? So, Tasneem, your your background. Theme. So, yeah, I mean, I, sh- I photographed weddings, and I photographed, I think, over 150 weddings. I've lost count in 21 different countries, so it wasn't even specific to Saudi or Arab weddings. And what I – it taught me n- narrative. It, ta- it taught me storytelling, uh, you know, a beginning and end, and – Mostly it taught me to find and seek the mundane moments that are not always the most um, colorful and the most um, exotic for me to photograph. Mm -hmm. So initially I enjoyed photographing Western weddings, you know, because (laughs) everyone's drunk and crazy and there's lots of guys or maybe, you know, that just men in general at weddings are more party and they show more uh, emotion. Kind of a relaxed atmosphere. Um, Whereas my weddings are um, segregated. So the women were always, you know, um, sitting down, not as much dancing eating so then I was stuck in this this is boring um, <laughs> but then I kind of had to push myself and struggled initially but now I, I it's very easy because it can be a glance it can be a touch it can be anything that I understand is an emotion and evo- uh, you know a, a simple emotion but that's evoking a movement uh, of some sort to the viewer so that was how I s- initially started and then to photograph that project Saudi Tales of Love it was following um, initially 10 women and one of them had an arranged marriage and one of them was a a daughter who never been in love and she doesn't understand that concept other than loving herself or a divorcee or a a widow and with all those women those stories are very universal if Mm -hmm. you saw the images you will not maybe you might perceive it from an Arab country just from the outside but in their homes they look like me and you there's Mm -hmm. nothing different about them only when you read the captions you realize that it's very specific to Saudi and the obstacles and struggles that they face as women um you know a stereotype is that saudi women can't drive yes it's actually a reality it's not a Mm -hmm. stereotype we are the only country that women can't drive but there's much more we have constraints by society by religion by you know government so with all those things those minority as women in saudi share so many different um constraints with anyone else around the world and the way that they overcome those obstacles Mm -hmm. is what I feel like is very important for viewers to understand. And I think that's what people will see from looking at your work, the photographs um, in the exhibition, but also we should say as part of a multimedia installation, there's an audio track Mm -hmm. and that's your voice on the audio track talking about women who cannot drive, but they can dive. And so there's an amazing, um, very simple, elegant portrait of a female diver. And Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's a very direct response to that notion of a different type of freedom oh yeah I mean initially everyone's asking so how is it how do you live there you know do you have to cover your face and do you have to you know how is it that you can't drive and I honestly think that's my least worry that I can't drive Mm -hmm. I have much more priorities for instance legal guardianship you know Saudi women are the only women in 
in the world that don't have authority over themselves. I don't have legal authority to divorce myself, to travel out of the country, to have um, any medical or even educational care. So all of those constraints are very important for us to fight for. And we are now. We are using social media. There's a Twitter and an Instagram account just for that. So to, to share those thoughts and say, this is what we really need. This is the change that we need. And to use the topic of my project, like we can't drive butts. Mm -hmm. We can do so many other things. Mm -hmm. We are powerful and amazing. And it's not only a selective of, you know, a handful of, of women that I had the privilege to meet. It's literally every woman that I meet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tanya, tell us a little bit um, from your perspective. You have a recent book that came out, Occupied Pleasures, but I know that you're you're kind of in the earlier stages of a new project. Are you comfortable talking about that for a moment? About because because people will see some of that work in the exhibition. Absolutely. Uh, what you have here is a is a mix of the past project, uh, Occupied Pleasures, as well as my new one, which uh, working title is uh, The Unholy Land: Sacred Space Odyssey. Um, Responding to what Tasneem said, uh, the uh, the notion of freedom is an interesting way. You, you can unpack a lot of uh, stereotypes and assumptions and also political reality. So Occupied Pleasures came about, as we say in Arabic, from underneath and underneath. Like It, it was a, a quiet way of critiquing the reality of the occupation of the West Bank, of Gaza, East Jerusalem. And um, this is a topic that two issues. It, there's not a lot of platform to discuss it, particularly in, in U.S. mainstream media. And it's a very hyper-photographed, narrated reality with a lot of reductive stereotypes, be it either victim or, or terrorist. And so finding a way of gently un unpacking how people use their freedom in these sort of absurdist uh, Kafka-esque realities. So it was using humor and the snippets of uh, taking your breath that I found a way of re-approaching the discussion of the occupation itself. So with that, um, I actually was the recipient of a new grant from Magnum Foundation on religion. And this particular pilot is funded by Columbia, NYU, The Revealer, which is a, a publication at NYU dealing in religion and critiquing the fact that mainstream religion is not really tackled in media properly or in depth and cre vibrantly. And so this new work, it's the first time that I'm actually tackling Israel and Palestinians and going to the heart of religion in different, uh, from from agnostics to atheists to Hasidic, Haridim uh, Jews, uh, secular Jews, Christian, Palestinians, Muslim, tackling it as a whole. And it's, uh, it's very early in pro pro uh, process right now. So you're just getting a little hint, a little taste of mm -hmm. some of the images that are coming. But what I'm hoping will be done, because there's going to be an immersive uh, media element to it, is I want it to almost be sacred space oddity. Like I want it to, to be, you're entering... Um, like almost like a time machine and and or a short story uh, time machine slash short stories and you go and you meet these vibrant characters but it'll kind of shake you out of your assumptions of mm. what that place is because on one hand it is the conflict and it is binary but on the other hand the binary is a false construct mm -hmm. and I should I should point out that um, a way of kind of characterizing your work or how I came to know your work was really through finding sort of small moments that are. Um, strange, ambiguous, um, unusual, sometimes hilarious, ironic. Um, you have a very particular way of finding a unique position um, within a, a landscape or looking at a particular um, situation. So I think that's a really a strong element within your work, which forces people to really think twice and look again and and really question their own assumptions. So I think, I hope people will see that in the show when they come look at your work. Th that's, <laughs> thank you so much for it. That's, that's what I strive for. And I think humor is something rather universal that people can, can connect with. And actually that sort of black humor mm -hmm. that I approach uh, in telling the stories of the Middle East was really informed a lot by by Texas realities mm -hmm. and humor. Well, and in, t in terms of being informed by particular experiences, um, this is a really goofy question to ask artists, but I always do. So who are some of the people um, that inspire you? So when you're photographing or when you're thinking about, 
you know, a particular project and how to kind of critique yourself. Who are some of the photographers that you're sort of thinking about um, as you're doing that? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a big <laughs> list. You want to go first, Tasneem? <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, I would like to say you, but that's so cliche. <laughs> Such a love fest. <laughs> um, no, but that, I mean, that actual Magnum Foundation project was the first one that kind of opened my eyes. Um, I, I enjoy um, seeing images by Martin Parr, especially with, <laughs> you know, street photography, because it's very ironic. But at the same time, it does question our minds of like, why, how do we act mm-hmm. in, in, in public or even um, in private? And then I, I really enjoy um, Maggie Stieber's work. Mm. And not only is she, uh, she a phenomenal human being, but also she's one of the first that has a very different uh, touch to every project that she um, photographs, and she's very sensitive um, to any story. So it can be something um, that's, you know, in Haiti, and it's war, and it's journalism, and it's very respectful to the people that she photographs, and it can also be something that's in her own hometown, or like her mother's very difficult relationship, um, because she died of dementia, and, mm-hmm. and the last few years was a struggle for her. So that shows in very intimate pictures, and we can have access to that. Well, <laughs> funny that you mentioned Martin Parr. That was uh, <laughs> being being a student at UNT, there was a lot of welcome distractions <laughs> on that campus, and in in that city uh, and uh, I maybe was not the most profusely uh, present photo student in my minor but uh, it was while being called into the office to discuss my lack of productivity <laughs> that I came across uh, Martin Parr's Bored Couples which ah. is what well, was a transformative experience seeing that book because it was that fine line between comedy and tragedy mm-hmm. it's an entire book showcasing endless couples and, you know, bodies taut in a flamenco dance course, you know, and, and yet the, the man yawning or people sitting in, at, at a table together. And it, it was so sublimely uh, humorous and tragic at once. And mm-hmm. it really... Well, that's that's contemporary Britain, really, isn't it? <laughs> but also, I think, if I may add, like, as a Saudi photographer, we are, we don't critique. We are not allowed to, as as just as people, as human beings, like to to bring up any question of culture and ask of any social structure is beyond uh, you know acceptable. Mm. So even to use any image, if the caption is not something that pride you know gives us pride, then it's bad. So for me to see the work of Martin Parr, I'm like, oh wow, he gets to do that, and no one is killing him. Like no, he's allowed. Well, yeah. he's had his fair share of critique, <laughs> though, from within yes, British certainly. society. Mm-hmm. But then there's also uh, Gohar Dashti, uh, who's one of my favorite. Do you know her work, yeah. Sarah? I, she blows my mind because she's one of the first. I would say that really uh, walk that fine, murky middle between fine art and documentary work. Mm -hmm. And uh, she expanded my approach because inside I was often feeling conflicted in which approach I wanted to take. It's conceptual, but it it is a documentation of the Mm -hmm. present and the emotive reality of of the characters that she presents. And she even brings in autobiographical (laughs) elements. And that particular work really informed and was a a breakout point for me. Mm -hmm. And and I used the phrase before, slow journalism. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's an opportune moment to kind of talk about what how you would describe that, what that is. For for me, I I find it problematic that uh, again to use this term parachute journalism, and I don't mean to imply that there are not fine journalists that come from beyond Mm -hmm. certain borders and come in and, and do quality Mm-hmm. journalism but that being said there are plenty who come in and make a lot of reductive assumptions mm-hmm. and how close can you get to the truth and how why would your documentation of someone why would your truth be greater than their truth of the person that you're documenting so this concept of collaborative uh, portraiture mm-hmm. some purists and journalism would definitely push against that but I actually think that once you're having a conversation with the community that you're in that is where you're actually venturing into a more interesting dialogue and slow journalism is simply immersive storytelling where you're spending quality time with the subjects and in the place that you're documenting before you even bring out your camera well, yeah. you know where I first b- yeah. before it was even a term it was actually while sitting in on Joseph Rodriguez's uh, by chance a, a class of his at Tisch NYU years ago and for those who don't know his work his uh, his work with uh, East uh, LA gangs is mm-hmm. it, it was a breakthrough work it was the, one of the first times that you actually kind of got beyond the, the the violence and the images and understood 
the community behind it and perhaps what was dri- driving some of this violence. And uh, he described his access into this very difficult community and he spent months not even bringing out his camera. I mean, mm-hmm. exactly, mm-hmm. exactly that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's very therapeutic, I must say. I mean, I initially started the project just photographing everything documentary. And I remember you were the one, Tanya, that ins- insisted I photograph something beyond the journalistic approach. It's like, I don't, this is everyday images. I want more, I want more. And in the end, I started asking each of the women, okay, how do you want to be portrayed? You have full control. I am just a camera holder with, you know, we played with emotions, with light, with movement. And with each one, it was so, extremely therapeutic that they're now telling each other to be photographed by me like (laughs) I have more women emailing me and contacting me because they want to be part of the project to have that experience it gives them pride it gives them a way to say that I am in control of my story and I I am control in having you know um, a strength and power and not just a weak woman who's from Saudi covered up Mm -hmm. I mean uh, another another uh, uh Minty, a student from the Arab documentary photo program, was Hiba Khalifa? Hiba Khalifa, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. She's Egyptian, single mother, works for an... Uh, for six days a week. Six days a week, works for an uh, Egyptian daily, makes peanuts, and has to... Her four-year-old, she, she basically is responsible for her four-year-old, and there's no other income. And she ended up winning this grant and working, and she did a project that, when she presented it, I burst into laughter, and then I burst into tears. And it, it was... There was the Cindy Sherman element of yes, she she wore different costumes and she had different women wearing costumes and it had on no, the one No, they're all hand, wearing bodysuits. Well, hmm. well, no, it was more than that. She 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 brings these characters in and constructs a totally different reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it turns out what she did is in her little extra room in her apartment, she would bring a woman in and ask them about their personal their personal whisperings of pain. And mm-hmm. sometimes it would be uh, an anorexic. Sometimes it would be, I was ugly, I was abused, uh, sexual abuse, different illusions. And she wouldn't say it outright. But, mm-hmm. but so she would sit and listen to the woman and then disappear for a few weeks and then construct the reality that she wanted to represent them yeah. and bring them back into the studio. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, body suits, but then bring in different elements. It was elements. all homemade posters mm-hmm. and, and paintings that she would make and different setups basically in this Three walled stage, tiny that she made. stage, but it was transformative. Yeah. And yeah. what was amazing about the work is you felt this woman, but you felt this transcendental release. But then it was also specific to Egypt, but then universal. Mm-hmm. And I actually went up to her, and several other people did, and asked her, "Can I come yeah, to your studio <laughs> to be?" Because it was like art therapy in one. And mm-hmm. I mean, then we laughed about the irony of let's go and get art therapy in, mm-hmm. in Egypt, you know. But that's, I think, where the more interesting work is coming out. And and so from what you're saying, like those ideas of universal experiences, sharing those universal experiences, kind of opens things up within your own practice and mm-hmm. whoever you're photographing, kind of whatever situation you're in. Um, and I should say for me as a curator that's what's been really exciting working with Rawir as a collective that you are seven although we're only showing six (laughs) different voices and different approaches and yet there's wonderful crossover and overlapping of particular universal themes and and ideas that I think certainly for our audiences here will be a really rich um, experience Uh, so we should probably talk about the other photographers in Rawir just for a minute (laughs) Just to be equitable. <laughs> well, for one thing, I think it's worth noting that Rawia, it, it, it began uh, in cafes, whisperings in cafes in Beirut and bars. Let's do this. And then Skype Around conversations. Around a table like this. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and then thanks to uh, technology, Skype, etc., we we banded together and created Rawia. But it was initially woman only. Rawi is male storyteller. Rawia is female. And we were often asked why only woman, why only woman. And there's kind of a movement now where... People are tired. For example, I am tired of being referred to as a woman photographer. Mm -hmm. It's quite sexist. Mm -hmm. And there's a pushback against that. Mm -hmm. And so we realized, you know, actually, let's open this up. And we just invited in our first two male photographers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so now we are Rawi, parentheses, Rawi, yeah. And it was partially inspired by Germaine Greer's quote, uh, the opposite of patriarchy is not matriarchy, but fraternity. Mm-hmm. And so we've bring in, of course, they're feminists. It goes without saying these males are feminists <laughs> that we brought in. Then. But yeah. they're fantastic storytellers. And so this is our first exhibit 
as a group. Mm -hmm. And as you noted, one of them is not in it because he's embedded with the Iraqi army right now and couldn't get online. Right. So we could we, we should explain to our listeners that that we could not get any images from him. So we were not able to produce produce any for the exhibition. But um, audiences, we can go online and, and see his yeah. work. Yeah. Gaith. Yeah. Right, so yeah. Gaith Abdul Ahad, uh, f- fantastic writer, and uh, he's probably the most hardcore in terms of he'll go into Yemen. He's on the front line of conflict. Mm-hmm. And he also reports for the Guardian um, newspaper, so you can see, read his stories. He's an incredible writer. You can read his stories and see his photographs online. Um, some of the other photographers, Laura Tamara. Or um, Tamara. Tamara basically did this project it's called Imagine an Arab Man. Picture an Arab Man. Picture an Arab Man. Mm-hmm. And um, she worked with 80 men taking p- portraits of them. Um, and they're all um, not wearing a shirt, but it's shoulder and above. And it's very romantic. It's very poetic. And it's extremely the opposite of what you, even I as an Arab, would expect from the way that we've been influenced by the media to always have this negative portrayal of an Arab man. Again, victim or you know perpetrator of violence. And it, yeah. the realization we don't ever recognize our, our men, our family members, our brothers, yeah. our mm-hmm. boyfriends, our fathers. So it's very beautiful, tender, evocative a very, work. A very simple, yeah. um, sort of sensuous portraits. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Then we have Laura Bushnox, who you want to talk about that? No, you go Is ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I read, I re- no, she did Cluster Bombs? Cluster Bombs. She did yeah. her Cluster Bombs, and it's a very personal story. Uh, uh, Laura is Palestinian herself, refugee. Uh, with, with uh, Initially, she didn't even have a passport. She does now, and so she followed a... Uh, Palestinian refugee from the south of Lebanon who uh, lost his legs because of actually American manufactured uh, cluster bombs sold to Israel that were dropped in the south during the 2006 conflict. And so she's followed this young refugee from a camp in the south of Lebanon for many years. And uh, it's a very, very um, intimate, heartbreaking, quiet work actually mm-hmm. uh, going beyond the, t- you know, uh, the, the typical imagery when you think of cluster bomb uh, imagery it, she really em- empowers the, uh, the voice the character mm-hmm. understanding what this did to so, his life so they're beautiful uh, they're sort of portrait slash still life images really I think you find of her work yeah and also Miriam Miriam Abdelaziz yes Miriam Who's Egyptian? Aziz <laughs> is Egyptian, uh, Swiss, French. Uh, she's sort of a transnational citizen of the world. Mm-hmm. And she, she documented uh, the uprising, the Egyptian uprising. And it was a very uh, hard moment for all of us because everyone was transfixed, including my, my husband, who's a, a lawyer, and he, he skipped work for days. We were all just transfixed watching what was happening. And she was there in the streets documenting. And then it was the biggest heartbreak, what followed and what has since followed. Um, And that work, actually, what she experienced uh, partially drove her. She hasn't really been documenting so much back in Egypt because she she's got a lot of as an Egyptian, a lot of personal personal pain, perhaps Mm -hmm. around some of the things that happened. Yeah. But so she's a, she's a portrait photographer. She's actually doing a fantastic uh, uh, project in America right now. And recently became, uh, after years of living in, in New York, she's now a citizen. Oh. And so that, that marked, uh, <laughs> she voted for the first time. And the, her new project is sort of hand in hand with, with that. Great. And also uh, Ziad bin Ramadan. Oof, oof, Ziad. <laughs> <laughs> for those who have, who, who have seen, uh, what's that Italian uh, film, ben- Benucci, what's his name? <laughs> the really, the, the comic, oh, Life is Beautiful. Oh, Life is Beautiful, yeah. He is that character. Oh. <laughs> He's kind of just quiet and quirky and ridiculous and you look at him and he looks like a hipster on the top and then you look down and he's wearing like these like like plastic flip flops <laughs> and he's just this goofy mischievous character and then when you look at his work he was also a recipient of and he the, was uh, from the same round as me and he's based in Tunisia, Tunisia, he's yeah. Tunisia. yes yeah. and his work in this particular like phosphate phos- phosphate <laughs> coal mining town mm-hmm. it's I don't think I've seen such tenderness and respect you could feel how the people that this beautiful character of his you feel it in the gaze of the people how they look back at him and the way he treated them but he photographed this community with almost magic it's almost Mm -hmm. like magical realism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's working now with peter van agmel who's a fellow mentor in the program uh red hook publishing his book Mm -hmm. is going to be coming out soon I think what makes us all connect in Rawi is that we're very dedicated in sharing stories that are actually um, 
mind provoking in a sense to show that we exist as a you know a middle eastern uh, narrative but also in a way that's similar to you wherever you are and we have the same happiness we have the same tears we have the same problems and issues and when those images are portrayed anywhere else it will show you how we i don't know i'm i'm trying to kind of go beyond the politics of what how different we mm-hmm. are and show how similar we are because mm-hmm. that only brings us together instead of being afraid good work for me the bottom line uh is if i produce work in a community if the people themselves and it might even be critical but the people in that work should recognize themselves um and if they don't then i failed and at the same time it should resonate i i think quite often probably because of my anthropology anthropological background uh i i am obsessed somewhat with narratives and counter narratives and reception so every single time i i put out work into the world it's painstaking because i'm analyzing okay how is this could this be mis- could this be perceived negatively could this be perceived in a in a different light than it's intended mm-hmm. and so there's that self critique at every step of the way and Absolutely. i think that's important from everyone as and not just as an artist you have to be aware of how that will be you know uh, re- how that will be perceived by someone else because you're trying to represent a lot of people and i think um the best way is to actually ask the people you photographed mm-hmm. how do you take this are you okay being represented in this way um if they agree with it great if they don't then there's a problem there's a very big problem there's something to learn from that okay. yeah yeah well we should uh bring our discussion to an end because i'm going to whisk you away to lead a masterclass for our students um and speaking of our students perhaps that's something we could finish on is just a few words about um just some advice or uh a sense of uh, how you can inspire our students to greatness <laughs> pursue your passion oh. <laughs> i i would have to say there's always this idea when you're a young photographer especially if you're going into to journalism that you have to follow the conflict zones and you have to go with yeah. it but actually i think there's work to be done here and texas is such a vibrant place there's so many stories and by chance it is very topical mm. what is happening with this election immigration the wall in the environment it's yeah. time this has never been uh, to be honest based in the middle east i've been watching uh, for the last few years developments in the us and and coveting to be back and documenting <laughs> what is happening right now mm-hmm. this is your time this is an important time to be documenting so find a story that you're passionate about that you will live with that you will take your time with and develop that story it should not be less than 3 months it could be 2 years whatever it is but just immerse yourself in that story and you've never as a young photographer you've never had more platforms or tools or places to get grants mm-hmm. so it's a very good time to be a photographer wow Okay, well, I'm inspired. <laughs> well, I'd like to say to Tasneem and Tanya, thank you so much for spending time with us today and talking about your work and the work of Rawia. And I'd like to just remind everyone again, our exhibition Rawia, We Do Not Choose Our Dictators is on at the Fort Worth Contemporary Arts and it's open until May 13th. Uh just in case you don't know, our regular hours are Wednesday through Saturday 12 to 5 p.m. But if you shoot us an email or drop us a line, uh or call us we can be there at other times to let you in if you have a tight schedule. So please come along, be a friend to the art galleries at TCU. And once again, thank you Tanya, thank you Tasneem, and this is Sarah Jane Parsons saying goodbye from the galleries at TCU.